Good evening. I'm Ernie Anastas, and here's what's happening. Men who are tougher than most, veteran police officers, are shedding tears tonight for a rookie cop executed in cold blood. Officer Edward Byrne was just 22 years old, the son of a retired police lieutenant. Officer Byrne was shot early this morning as he sat in his parked patrol car. He was on stakeout assignment in the South Jamaica section of Queens. That portion of the 103rd Precinct is known as a drug-dealing supermarket. The execution is being read as a bold message from drug peddlers, but tonight, heavily armed police units are patrolling South Jamaica, sending out a message of their own. Jim Doling is live now at the scene. Jim? Tidy on the patrol car, standing guard out here tonight, a black cross, mourning the loss of one of their youngest, one of their newest, one of their own. You know, this neighborhood here in South Jamaica is never very calm. The crack dealers and criminals make sure of that, but it is particularly tense out here tonight after the brazen cold-blooded murder of a man who wanted only to keep this neighborhood safe. The, men, the police mean to keep the, put the men responsible in jail, men who overpowered a young police officer here earlier this morning as he sat alone in his car, never getting the chance to pull his own gun. It is a mistake the police are unlikely to make again. Tonight they are armed with 9mm automatics and more. They wear bulletproof vests and they patrol the area. Other police go door to door to get some hint of what happened. But neighbors are reluctant to say much. A man who will kill a cop will kill anyone. One neighbor hung a black ribbon on a signpost to remember Edward Burns. We have what appears to be a deliberate assassination of a police officer acting in the performance of his duty. Burns was in his patrol car early this morning, parked in front of this man's house. He is a witness in a major drug selling case against Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols, who now resides on Rikers Island. Police believe that it's possible that Nichols engineered this hit from his Rikers Island jail cell. The parked car pulled up with its lights off. Two men got out and one fired into the patrol car, killing Burns, a police officer, for just four weeks. This afternoon, police found the car in question, but a man who was near the vehicle has not been charged by police. He is being questioned. Police report that that man was questioned and then later released uh, this evening. They have arrested no one else, no one else in connection with this murder. This is not the far first time that there has been violence at this home, this home of this important drug witness. There were two fire bombings earlier, uh, early last, late last year. Nobody has been hurt before this, before a young police officer was gunned down early this morning. Reporting live from South Jamaica, I'm Jim Dolan, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Jim. And tonight, angry questions are being hurled at Police Commissioner Benjamin Ward. Among them, why was Officer Byrne out there alone? Ward, who took time out for a police promotion ceremony today, defended the solo patrol. Robert, he said Sony. there was no warning that Byrne was, in fact, in danger. The witness was the person we were protecting and not the police officer. The threats were against the witness and not against the police officer. Uh, there was no indication of anyone trying to stop the police from enforcing drug laws or protecting witnesses in that area. Commissioner Ward said that he was angered by Burns' murder, and he told the audience the killers would be caught and the attempt to scare people off the war on drugs would not work. Despite the murder, one man patrols continue tonight. This lone officer was guarding a house in Queens where border babies are sheltered. Last summer, that house was firebombed. The officer said the solo assignment didn't bother him and that he didn't think that this particular stakeout posed any danger. The world of drug trafficking, the recent cold, calculated assassination of a young New York City policeman assigned to protect a drug case witness was something new and deeply disturbing. It made headlines nationwide. It also focused attention on one neighborhood that is now being talked up as a test case, a test of whether the war on drugs can be won anywhere in the USA. Correspondent Harold Dow reports tonight on the neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood fight to take back the street. It may not look like it, but there's a big battle raging in these streets of Jamaica, Queens. On one side, the largest police force in the country. On the other side, drug dealers, armed to the teeth and with untold wealth. Police are trying something new here, a tactical narcotics team called TNT. It's a coordinated effort by city, state and federal officers, and more than 100 of them are closing down crack dens and arresting drug dealers. Many people in the neighborhood are afraid, and some say TNT is only a Band-Aid. We need an army, a big army. What the cops are doing is just like the cockroaches. You got them in your apartment, and, I, and you spray and it comes downstairs to me. I spray to go up to you. The new assault was put into motion after a policeman was shot to death by drug dealers. But even the man leading the project is doubtful that it will succeed. 
this is a national problem that's going to take a greater commitment by the national uh, government to, to handle it. I believe that Eddie uh, Burns, the, the young police officer's death, is going to serve somewhat as a catalyst. Four men have been charged with the policeman's murder, and his father has taken up the cause of cleaning up the neighborhood. Unless we do something here, we could end up, uh, I said, at my son's wake. Our streets could end up being as lawless as the streets of Bogota and Beirut. Uh, individually, we cannot take on the drug dealers. They are an army. They are a massive army. In another part of the city, a people's army is fighting drug dealers with some homemade strategy. And they appear to be winning, for now. That's 10-4. Let me have a report on that when, you know, when you finish. Is that a 10-4? 10-4, brother. Muslims from this Brooklyn mosque patrol the streets, and if they even think drugs are being sold, they call the police. In the war against drugs, it's sometimes hard to tell the good guys from the bad. The man in the hood is getting a $10,000 reward for identifying the murderer of another policeman in 1986. That took some courage, and he's wearing a hood because he's afraid of retaliation. So those citizens who do not come forth are really surrendering and they're giving up. Uh, and, and if you do that, you're going to turn the country over and your community over to uh, uh, the crack dealers. A lot is at stake in the neighborhood drug skirmishes. If this special undercover task force cannot retake Jamaica, Queens, a limited target, the outlook is bleak for winning the drug war nationwide. Harold Dow, CBS News, New York. Congress, the evidence of heavy money and heavy violent drug traffic is all around. Some of the worst of it revolves around the buying, selling, and using of crack, an especially addictive, deadly, and cheap form of cocaine. CBS News correspondent Harold Dow tonight investigates the high publicity alleged national crackdown on crack and the reality of whether it's had any real impact. Crack is the most devastating drug that, that we've seen in the 20th century. It was two years ago that the warning went out about this highly potent form of cocaine called crack. Law enforcement officials feared that it would sweep across this country like a brush fire out of control. So far, the crack fire has not consumed the country, but it is burning wildly in some major cities. It's as bad as it could possibly be in a small number of cities where it's very commonly used. Today, those cities aren't fighting a fire, they're waging a war. A recent Justice Department study shows a startling link between cocaine use and crime. In New York, 63% of those arrested for any crime tested positive for recent cocaine use. In Washington, D.C., the figure was 52%. In Los Angeles, 47%. And in Miami, in a separate study, 75% of those arrested showed recent cocaine use. Justice Department officials now say there is a direct link between crime and cocaine. But there is debate among researchers over whether people commit crimes to support their habit or whether cocaine use causes criminal behavior. Ooh, I got, uh, got rocks. I got powder. In Miami, the war on crack cocaine is a case of halting supply and demand. Look, man, I'm a police officer. You're under arrest. Hello? Yes, sir, you are. This is a police sting operation where the buyers are the target. The theory, get rid of the buyers, and the pushers won't have anyone to sell to. To win the war is a bigger picture. We're talking about pitting a $70 million police department budget against a multi-billion dollar drug industry. And there's just no contest. Another front is being fought by the medical community. Doctors are currently testing an antidepressant drug called ermipramine that could have a dramatic effect on as many as 40% of this nation's cocaine abusers. There's no question that it, it diminishes craving in some, of our, in some of our patients. It also diminishes the effects of cocaine. And while doctors think amipramine may help the motivated middle-class cocaine user, they have doubts the drug will have any effect on the hardcore crack addict. For the people on the front lines who are fighting this country's crack cocaine war, victory is nowhere in sight. We're losing this fight because the the producing countries are continuing to produce more. The federal government is not stopping that stuff at the border. We're trying to mop up the flood of drugs that's coming in here, and we can't handle it. More evidence that the cities are losing the war on drugs came as New York's police buried one of their own today. 22-year-old Edward Byrne was shot to death early Friday morning. 
Fast son Eddie. Sitting in a police car. Representing and protecting us. Can be wasted. By scum. And none of us is safe. Officer Byrne had been guarding a witness scheduled to testify against neighborhood crack dealers. Harold Dow, CBS News, New York. Traps right, understand how to get that. Uh, Ran down on them niggas with a flip back. You ain't never seen none of nigga live like that. I was still getting sex back. Had to fuck around getting them packs back. Niggas. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, boy Scotty. You know, before we start this video, all I want y'all to do is smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share this video. And make sure y'all hit that notification bell. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Just smash the like button. It's your boy Bullets Gotti. It's the Bullets Gotti Show. Salute. This video, please make sure that you like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Make sure we get into the algorithm. Like, share, and subscribe if you like this, this video. And hit the notification bell. It's your boy Bullets Gotti. Bullets Gotti Show. Too clean. What's up, everybody? This is your boy Bullets Gotti. So this video right here is about Gus Faraci and Pappy Mason, right? Now, if you know about the story of Gus Faraci and Pappy Mason, right? Both stories are kind of similar. They're a little bit the same time frame, but a little later. They both had George W. H. W. Bush talking about both cases. Uh, Pappy Mason, who was incarcerated, who was locked up, had a, 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 a confrontation got was parole violated he was locked up in 1988 and he ordered the hit on an officer which was edward burns edward burns brother was an fbi agent which later was the reason why they got incarcerated and he had the coverage of george hw bush gus Arachi, um a mob associate for the banana crime family um he was running around with Gregory Scarfa, Jr. and Sr. He was working with Gregory Scarfa at his gym, Wimpy Boys, and he was selling drugs, and he was under investigation by the DEA. And he killed Hatcher, a DEA agent, Agent Hatcher, who got Everett Hatcher, who got killed in 1989. So, in both cases, in the aftermath of both cases, right, I had a conversation, shout out to my brother Brian Glaze Gibbs. I had a conversation about this case with Gus Farachi and Pappy Mason and the whole situation with the Edward R. Burns situation. Now, this is how I feel, right? If you look at the case, right, the similarities, both cases, 
put a ripple effect on the narcotics game. It helped out George H.W. Bush campaign. And it was also, he also talked about both cases. If you look at the Gus Farachi case, right, and you look at the Pappy Mason case, and you look at both individuals, unstable, um, dangerous, and needed to be stopped, and a liability. The only big difference is Pappy was incarcerated and he ordered to hit from jail. Gus Farachi was on the street. What I respect about the mob and the Bonanno, and the Bonanno crime family and what they did in that situation is they took swift justice, street justice, and got rid of Gus Rashi. It took them a couple months to get their hands on him, which they got him in November. But they was able to get rid of Gus Farachi. Now, Pappy Mason case. Because he was incarcerated. Nothing could be done with him. If Cat and if Pappy was on the street and if Cat had his soldiers get rid of Pappy, Cat probably would have not been in the predicament that he was in and he would have not been incarcerated doing the time that he's doing because of that case and a lot of a lot of a lot of that a lot of those liabilities would have probably the Scott Cobbs and the and the, uh, you know Dave McClurys and all of them and the, and the other the, the other individuals you know Marshall and all of them that was involved in that case would have also been clipped off because it brought a lot of heat and attention once you bring heat to attention, you 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 messing up the operation in the business. And one thing that I respect with the mob did, the Bonanno family, Gambinos, the the um the the the, the, the Columbos, and all the family the Lucchese's, is that all the five families took time and said we got to deal with this problem and clean house, and they clean it in a house, and got rid of Gus Farachi and took street justice. If Cat would have did the same thing, those guys would have been killed and probably, you know, if you really look at it, would it be as crazy as it was with the coverage that they had if they had gotten rid of Pappy Mason, who was the liability, and the other three members of the hit team. If they'd have got rid of them. And the Pappy was on the street. This would have not. Spiral out of control. You know what I'm saying. Once somebody like that. Spirals out of control. They crumble the empire. And in the case of Gus Farachi. Is that he. Put a monkey wrench. But the problem got solved. Before it became a bigger problem. And. The mob is all about the money. They don't want nobody messing up the money, messing up the bag. And Gus Farachi was messing up the bag. Okay, he was messing up the bag for all the five families. So he had to go. Just like Pappy Mason was messing up the bag for Cat. And this is why Cat has his discrepancies about Pappy Mason. You know what I'm saying? I was watching Sammy the Bull thing where he said, you know, Pappy was doing a lot of violations. People was doing a lot of violations. And if Cat would have, you know, been more, not to say he wasn't a, a boss, but if he'd have been a stronger type of boss. And they got rid of the liabilities, just like the Nicky Barnes case. If they got rid of the liabilities when Nicky had done what he did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Somebody becomes a liability, you have to get rid of the liabilities because they become problems, major problems. You know, small problems become major problems. And in the cases of Gus Farachi and Pappy Mason, Gus Farachi became a huge problem for the Italian mafia. So he had to be done with and he had to be dealt with and he had to be dealt with 
very fast and calm. And he was done the way he was done. Swift street justice. And the mob went back to business. You know? And that's what people got to understand is that, you know, when you look at both situations, it's two sad situations. But when you have homicidal, you know, crazed individuals that don't care, you have to get rid of them. And that's what I felt that that was the problem. Too many male egos. You know, and too many dudes want to be chiefs. And in the streets, you know, the urban environments, this is why a lot of drug crews get crumbled and dismantled because there's a lot of, a lot of Indians, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of chiefs, but not enough Indians. You know, and it's like the problem is, is that when you look at this whole, you look at both cases, is that both cases was done exactly the same way, you know, but the only thing different is they were standing by the window and did it. It was like a drive-by when they did it, and both happened in Queens. So, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot get mad at a person for being who he is. But in the Gus Farachi case, he did a lot. He did too much. And he had to be dealt with swiftly. And you got to respect that. He was dealt with swiftly and accordingly. And after that, he got nothing to say about it. You don't got nothing else to say about it because the mob did their job. They laid them down. He wasn't a bad. He, you know, people go, oh, he wasn't a bad. No. Try to rob that man for his money. He's a thief. Oh, I'm, I'm a, oh, I don't, damn, you know? That's how you do it. But I'm going to keep it real. You know, when you look at that whole case and you look at Pappy Mason, Pappy Mason was never supposed to be a boss. He didn't have the characteristics of being a boss. He was a hothead. You know, a hothead like him crumbled the whole empire. You know? If you look at a lot of that whole scenario and that whole story is that these dudes... Is weird. That's why when they be talking about me, and when I come with the facts, the facts is the facts. And this Gus Farachi situation is the facts is the facts. That the man deserved what happened to him because he brought problems to Puff the cat. And that's the problem. They didn't understand that, you know, when you look at that and you look at the case with the Hatcher case and you see how the DA was on his heels, the FBI was on Gus Farachi heels, the NYPD was on his heels. But the only two dudes that was able to get him was mafia made hitmen. And they got the job done. He was the liability that hurt their business. And they're not going to go, you know, and stand next to a dude that violated their business. So now the harassment leads up. Everything leads up where dudes just want to get money, but you kill one of theirs. And the one thing that I respect that the Panano's did, they... They got rid of Gus Farachi. They laid him down and they went back to business. 
because he was the problem. And in the Pappy Mason case is, is that he messed up the whole empire and he wasn't take, he didn't get taken care of. Now, if he was on the street and Cat would have moved that way, Cat probably would have not been doing the time that he's doing. They would have not, he would have probably been already freed. But because you had somebody like a Pappy Mason, a hothead, a crazed individual, you know, that did crazed things is the reason why he's incarcerated. But he, if he was on the street, he should have got the same type of treatment Gus Farachi got. He should have been hit the same way Gus Farachi was hit. Because once you do things that violates business and violates the, the, the threshold of getting money, and stopping the bag by doing that stupid actions, you should not be in organized crime. And that's a fact. So, with that being said in this Gus Farachi video, and Pappy Mason is, is that both guys were hotheads that needed to be dealt with. One got murdered by the streets, the other one will die in prison, drinking toilet water. So, with that being said, is that, when you look at both situations, same situation, two different futures. One was one, the street justice got a hold of him and laid him down. Two, the police got him. He's in the feds and he's going to die in there. So with that being said, like I said, the mob handled their business. If Cat, Cat should have handled his business and got rid of the cloud chasers. So, like I said, Pappy Mason and Gus Farachi was bad for business. And once you're bad for business, you have to be exit out of here because you're now a liability and they're liable to do anything so that being said man it's your boy bullets got you already know what it is salute